Good morning. We have a, uh, a programming note. Um, we are in the inaugural Sunday of using new equipment back there, uh, new camera equipment, new machine to process the stuff, and, and hopefully a better experience for those of us who are at home on Zoom. Um, and in a new situation like that, inevitably glitches will occur. And so we ask for your patience and grace as we work through these things. Everybody that's involved is new at it um, with the equipment and with the techniques and whatnot. So um, if something happens, you'll, you can blame it on them, blame it on me, blame it on something. But something may well happen. And uh, along those lines, um, those of you at home, we welcome your feedback. Um, because uh, you are the uh, ultimate people who can de determine whether we're moving in the right de direction or not. So we, we covet your, your feedback and your prayers as we, as we use this new stuff. This is the second in our series of three sermons on the Old Testament book of Esther. You'll recall that the story takes place in ancient Persia, during the, king, the, during the reign of King Ahasuerus from the dec, in the decade from 480 to 470 BC. The Persian Empire encompassed most of the known world at the time. And there we go. <laughs> Try that. There we go. The Persian Empire encompassed most of the known world at the time, stretching from India to Greece and from what is part of now Russia to Egypt. Through a series of seemingly unrelated events, a Jewish girl by the name of Esther finds herself queen of this empire, and her husband, the king, owed a debt of gratitude to the cousin who raised her, Mordecai. This morning, we'll be covering chapters three through six of the book, and in my retelling of the narrative, I'm filling in some of the details of the story where scripture is silent. My additions, I believe, are consistent with the text, but they're the product of my mind, not the inspired word of God, and I think it's proper to note that up front. Before we proceed into the heart of this book, let's commit our time here to the Lord. Father, we ask your blessing on our time here this morning. Open your word for us. Make us understand the lessons of this book. May we take from this meeting a renewed joy in your providence and in your sovereignty over all the earth and in your love for us. We ask all this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. As we saw last time, as we looked at the book of Esther, the, city, the setting is the capital city of Susa. And Mordecai had done a good service for the king when he uncovered an assassination plot hatched by two inner circle guards and informed Esther, who in turn alerted the king. The guards were found guilty and executed by impalement, a grisly way to die. The king never thanked Mordecai. Indeed, there is no record of him ever meeting Mordecai in the time just after the foiled assassination plot. But that's how life is. Sometimes you don't get thanked for the good things you do. About five years then elapsed, and during that time, King Ahasuerus promoted a fellow named Haman over all the officials of the kingdom, the equivalent of a prime minister. We're not told why Haman is promoted, but he must have performed some service to the king or otherwise impressed the king with his abilities to run the ship of state. In chapter 5 of the book, Haman recounts to his friends the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above all the officials and servants of the king. He clearly was an accomplished man, a leader, one who could energize his followers and to buy into his goals. And it would be a mistake to assume that he was merely a villain with no redeeming qualities. Hardly anyone is pure evil, which is a lesson for us today. Often the enemies of God appear as 
wise and accomplished people. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it's not strange if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, as the Apostle Paul wrote. Haman is described as being an Agagite, which has prompted most commentators through the ages to conclude that he was a descendant of King Agag, who you'll recall from the book of 1 Samuel was king of the Amalekites, the arch enemies of Israel. After careful study on this point, I don't think the adjective refers to that. The Bible records that the Amalekites were all killed during the time of Saul. And Agag himself was hacked to pieces by Samuel saying, your mother shall be childless among women. That doesn't sound to me like Agag had descendants, and scripture does not mention that people again. Rather, there was a region of the Persian Empire called Agag, which is mentioned in one of the tablets recovered and translated by archaeologists in the city of Khorzabad, which lies about 12 miles north of Nineveh. And someone who hailed from that place would also have been called an Agagite. Alternatively, the term could refer metaphorically to anyone who was an arch foe of Israel. Haman certainly came to be one of those. Whoever he was, he demanded and for the most part got the respect and obeisance of all the other officials in the capital. I say for the most part because Mordecai would have none of it. He stubbornly refused to bow and pay homage to Haman. It's worth noting that Mordecai doesn't otherwise exhibit any, author, any other authority-defying tendencies. He was present in Susa because his people had been exiled, it is true. But that forced relocation had happened during the time of his great-grandfather. And if Mordecai had wanted to return to Judea, he was likely free to do so as other Jews were there at work in rebuilding the temple. And if he were supportive of overthrowing the Persian Empire, he wouldn't have lured the king about the assassination plot. He had a government job with some authority, hardly the pursuit of someone opposed to the government. That's what being, quote, in the king's gate, unquote, meant. God's law did not prohibit his showing respect for those in authority, even if they were pagans. So we don't know Mordecai's motivation. One thing seems clear. No one in Haman's place would have gotten there without a very public record of service to the king. And public officials, through their prominent actions and statements, demonstrate their attitude toward the people groups under them. It could well be that Haman had exhibited animosity toward God's people in earlier times, and Mordecai knew he was no friend of Israel. It could also be that the deference demanded by Haman exceeded that of normal rulers and was instead worship. God's law prohibited worshiping anyone other than himself, and Mordecai would thus have refused to participate. Recall that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down and worship the great image that Nebuchadnezzar had created, but they got tossed into the fiery furnace for their trouble. For his part, Haman was initially unaware of Mordecai's defiance. Day after day, Mordecai's co-workers asked him why he refused to show Haman respect, even, apparently, in spite of the king's command. Mordecai's refusal was thus a potentially fatal act. After a time, those co-workers told Haman of Mordecai's refusal and of his heritage, and Haman became enraged. Now, from the standpoint of leadership, open defiance is a big problem. It breeds disrespect, and allowing it to continue reflects poorly on the leader. It gives other disgruntled followers ideas that they can defy authority as well. It's a morale killer, and effective leaders quickly, quickly respond to minimize negative ripple effects. But we don't have that here. And we know that for several reasons. First, Haman didn't immediately discipline Mordecai. Instead, deciding to address this defiance on a broader level 
which would take nearly a year to implement. In the meantime, Mordecai continued to openly refuse to give Haman deference. Second, as prime minister, Haman could have summarily fired or had Mordecai punished as a warning to other co-workers. But the text indicates that Haman sneered at punishing only Mordecai. Third, Haman looked at this as an opportunity to kill, to, to, to kill not only Mordecai, but also to eradicate Mordecai's people. There's nothing like mass extermination to send a message, but it would be a gross over-response to a offense. Clearly, Haman's anger transcended mere leadership considerations. There's definite evidence of hostility toward Mordecai's people. We might wonder why Haman hated the Jews so. But then there are many examples down through history of the hatred of God's people. Perhaps their insistence on remaining separate and apart offended the peoples with whom they lived. Or perhaps their continued worship of Jehovah offended the people around them. But we mustn't forget that Satan is the enemy of all God's possessions. And God's people would thus be target number one for him. Haman was therefore the tool of Satan. As a result, Haman now schemes to put his plan into effect. His advisors cast lots, the Hebrew name for which are, are pure, to determine the optimum time for the genocide. It was not outlandish to cast lots to assist in making decisions at that time. It was and is a tangible demonstration of belief in the sovereignty of God. Belief in a God who will make the dice fall as he wills. In recognition of that, a number of times in the Bible, a question is put to God and the lots relied upon to show his answer. Joshua cast lots to determine which tribe got which portion of the promised land. The apostles cast lots to determine whether Joseph or Matthias should fill the place of Judas among the twelve. Proverbs 16.33 says this, The lot is cast into the lap but its every decision is from the Lord. So although we don't know who Haman thought controlled the lots, we do know who actually controlled them. And our God, in his providence, made the lots suggest a date for the slaughter of his people nearly a year away. We've mentioned the providence of God a number of times in our discussion in this book, and I wonder if we all grasp what it means. The simplest definition I could find is this. That continued activity of God, whereby he rules all things with his ultimate ends in mind, so as to secure the accomplishment of his divine purpose. God is not a passive observer. He's not a mere spectator of life's stage. He works through the actions of men and nature to bring about his decrees. The providence of God, then, is the fingerprint of a sovereign creator over his creation, steering events so that they serve his purposes. Were the providence of God absent from the world, none of his promises could be kept. Indeed, the promises themselves are a function of his providence. It's the intangible hand of God working down through history. So, Haman went to the king and alerted him of a problem in the kingdom, uh, a cancer, if you will, that was within the king's empire. A particular people, scattered and dispersed through the provinces who were different than, from all the other peoples and who didn't keep the king's laws. Allowing them to remain among the king's subjects would not be profitable. Haman proposed that they be destroyed and offered 10,000 talents of silver toward the effort. In today's dollars, that amount of silver is worth over $213 million. Haman was a man of means, and he was willing to spend his wealth to eradicate God's people. Here in verse 10 of chapter 3, for the first time, Haman is described in the text as the enemy of the Jews. He then suggested that the king issue a decree that everywhere in the kingdom, on that day, almost a year away, all God's people were to be annihilated. 
And Haman must have been persuasive because the king not only agreed to the plan, he gave Haman his signet ring, symbol of his royal authority, and directed him to use that money and any people he needed to get the job done. So letters were sent to all the provinces that on a certain day, all the Jews were to be slaughtered, young and old, men, women, and children, and their goods plundered. Everywhere in the empire they were to be killed, which would include Judea, where workers labored in rebuilding the temple. If carried out, this plan would have wiped God's people from the earth. It bears noting that this is a king who is yanked to and fro by his subordinates. We saw that with the handling of Vashti, the former queen. We see it here with Haman, and we'll see it again as the story unfolds. No doubt, Ahasuerus thought that Haman was acting in the king's interest, but he doesn't appear to ask too many questions. Instead, after the decree was signed and dispatched for delivery to all the provinces, the king and Haman sat down to drink. At this point, things seemed to be going well for Haman. The king enjoyed his company and had entrusted the running of the government to him. He had the respect of all the nobles in the empire. What he said got done. And that thorn in his side, the refusenik Mordecai, along with all his people, had a date with destiny. Soon, they would be relegated to the dustbin of history. Good riddance. When Mordecai heard the news that all his people were to be killed, and this as a result of his personal defiance of the despised Haman, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Had he gone too far? No doubt he had no idea his stance would jeopardize so many lives. Was this to be the end of God's people? He felt the weight of responsibility, not only of being the cause of the catastrophe, but also of finding a remedy. Now what? Mordecai's distress was no secret, and it attracted the attention of Esther's operatives, I'll call them. Esther was cloistered in the Haman. Uh, in, the harem, in, in the harem, and had little or no contra contact with the happenings outside the palace. But she had young women and eunuchs who were under no such restrictions, and thus were her eyes and ears, as it were. They saw Mordecai's distress and reported back to her. Alarmed, she sent one of them back to ask Mordecai of the problem. And so Mordecai related all that had happened about Haman the money that Haman had pledged toward their extermination, and the edict that had gone out from Susa mandating the destruction of God's people all across the empire. But then it occurred to Mordecai that Esther should be able to help. She had the ear of the king. If the king truly loved her, and it seems as though he did, she ought to be able to get the king to relent and reverse that death sentence. This, Mordecai told her representative and directed him to ask Esther to intercede with the king. But interceding with the king was a tricky business and fraught with peril. You see, no one could approach the king. Sorry, no one could approach the king on his own initiative without risking his life. Entering the king's presence without being summoned meant instant death, unless, upon seeing you, the king stretched out his golden scepter toward you. In other words, the king's inaction or inattention could mean the end of your life. He had to want to see you, to be eager to see you, to save you from destruction. That's a tall order under normal circumstances, and Esther had even more reason for concern. Despite her being 
despite her being, their being married and Esther being his chief wife, the king had not sum, summoned her into his presence in over 30 days. Given that situation, Esther initiating contact with the king could well be the last thing she ever did. What a contrast between the approachability of the Persian king and that of our heavenly father, now that Christ has done his work. Israel had begged Moses at Sinai to be the mediator between Jehovah and his people, for they were terrified at his majesty. And later, no one was allowed into the Holy of Holies, lest, uh, lest he be struck dead, except the high priest, and then only once each year. But now, far from risking our lives in doing so, we are encouraged to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. Can we grasp the utter magnitude of that privilege? As powerful as the king of Persia was, as large an empire as was his, it was nothing when compared with God who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. And yet, we do not suffer under any disability in approaching him. His rule is vast beyond measure, and our invitation made possible through Christ's death, imputing righteousness to us, is equally as vast. Do we appreciate the standing we now have with God? Esther did not have that standing even with her husband. Mordecai was not impressed with Esther's concerns, however. He reminded her that the edict applied to her as well. She was a Jew and would be killed along with the rest of her people, notwithstanding her present position. And then he said something very interesting. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will still perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. What was he speaking of here? He's preaching the gospel to her, isn't he? He's saying essentially that there is a covenant between God and Abraham and that salvation will come through Abraham's seed. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Galatians. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations of the world be blessed. Paul, in effect, is saying that the promises to Abraham are the gospel preached beforehand. And Mordecai has chimed in saying, God is not going to let his people be wiped from the earth. The victory train was leaving the station with or without Esther. It seems to me that we observe a sea change in Mordecai in the space of a few verses. In verse 2 of chapter 4, Mordecai is distressed and has clothed himself in sackcloth and ashes, the traditional garb of someone in deep mourning. But in verse 14, we see in him a quiet confidence that deliverance will come, even if he didn't know how or from where. And although he'd previously directed Esther not to reveal her heritage, he now encourages the queen to publicly embrace her people and intercede with, for them using the king's affection for her as the means. Will she hop into the fray? Esther asked Mordecai to gather all of God's people who were in Susa and fast for her for three days. And she would gather all of her people inside the palace, and they would do the same. 
Here's that reference again in scripture. We're anticipating the third day. We've spoken of it before from this platform. Special encounters with the Lord happen frequently in scripture on the third day. After, she, after three days, she would approach the king, and if she died, she died. Esther is now resolved to save her people or die trying. The third day arrived, and Esther dressed in her finest royal robes and stood inside the inner court in direct view of the king. Her heart was pounding so hard. It's a wonder everyone in the room didn't hear it. And you could hear the low murmur of conversations among those in the room trail off as they all noticed her just standing there until there was a deathly silence. Everyone in the room just stared there and held their breath because they knew that the queen might just have committed suicide. The tension in the room was palpable. And all eyes slowly turned from the queen to the king to gauge his response. But the king's eyes lit up and a grin spread across his face. The room began to breathe again. Queen Esther, said he, as he stretched out his scepter toward her. What is your request? It shall be given to you even to the half of my kingdom. Esther strode up to the king and replied that she had prepared a feast for him and would be honored if the king and Haman would dine with her that day. This delighted Ahasuerus, and he sent word for Haman to join him at Esther's feast. After dinner, the king pressed Esther about what she wanted from him. And she put him off, asking that he and Haman come to another feast the next day, and she would then tell him. Esther was now biding her time, just as Haman had done. For his part, Haman seemed pleased and honored that the queen enjoyed his company as much as the king did. Why, he'd been invited to spend more time with the two of them tomorrow. Clearly, he was on the A list. Perhaps he was the A-list. As Haman left the palace that day, he had a spring in his step. The world was his oyster. He spoke and things happened. Everyone understood his power and greatness and the glory that was rightly his. That is until he encountered Mordecai on the way out, who refused once again to give him the honor he deserved. At once, his mood soured, and all the rage that he had felt toward this, this insect of a man flooded back upon him. How dare he stub me? I cannot wait until he gets his comeuppance. When he got home, his mood had softened, and he gathered his friends and his wife for dinner and regaled them with his accomplishments. But the image of Mordecai haunted him, and he mentioned the offensive man to his guests. They suggested a quick solution. Why didn't he erect a wooden beam and impale Mordecai the Jew on it? A fitting death for the rascal. Ask the king for a writ of execution, and then take care of business. The others said, Make a statement with it. Don't merely execute him. Show him off as a public spectacle of what would happen to people who disrespect you. Use a beam, say, 40 feet high. No, someone else recommended. Go big or go home. Make that baby 75 feet high. Yeah, no one in Susa will miss it because they'll be able to see it from anywhere. Haman thought that was just the ticket, the height of the pole matching that of his ego, and he gave orders to have the pole erected. Then he hurried back to the palace to get the king's assent. As it happened, and in the providence of God, on that night, the king could not get to sleep 
He tossed and turned for some time and then gave up and ordered that the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, be brought in and read to him. There's nothing like hearing all the mighty deeds you have done to get you in a good mood. And again, in the providence of God, the assistant turned to the passage in the book, which recorded Mordecai's alerting the king about the assassination plot, and that had been foiled as a result. And the king inquired of his assistants, how did we thank Mordecai for that loyal service? We didn't thank him, came the reply. Nothing was done for him. That struck the king as ungrateful, as it was, and he determined to fix that oversight. Better late than never, as the story, as the saying goes. Of course, the king was primarily thinking of himself. Kings reward past loyalty because that encourages future loyalty. Ahasuerus wanted to ensure that Mordecai remained committed to the king's welfare. We must think of some way to honor him. Who's in the court now? The king apparently had no confidence in his ideas for how to reward such a favor and sought advice from anyone available. Haman has just entered the palace. Excellent. Bring him to me. Of course, Haman was on a mission of his own. The gallows built he wanted to Hazuerus to give him the green light on Mordecai's execution. This was going to be great. He could hardly wait. But before he'd had a chance to bring that subject up, the king had something he wanted Haman's advice on. Just another example of why I'm so indispensable to him, he thought. Tell me, Haman, what should we do for the man whom the king delights to honor. Oh, shucks. <laughs> He's asking for my advice on how to honor me. Talk about writing your own ticket. Well, Haman replied, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let, ro let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor. And let them lead him on a horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. There's something of Haman in all of us. Don't we all crave recognition by those in authority of rewards to which we think we're entitled and of adulation from those around us? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, but that works in reverse as well. Your heart is a window into what you most desire. It's a symptom of our fallen nature that we have an inflated view of ourselves. That we're, at, we're the center of our universe. Our looking out for number one is an outgrowth of our being number one in our minds. George Whitfield wrote in his journal, Oh, that I could always see myself in my proper colors. I believe I should have little reason to fall down and worship myself. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Not so, Haman. He was convinced that his ship had finally come into port. He was to be honored even more than he had been to date. The king liked Haman's ideas about honoring a favorite and responded, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew that sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you've mentioned. Can you just see the, the frozen smile 
the, the deer in the headlights eyes staring at the king. This is an epic fail on so many levels. How do I salvage this disaster? Mordecai? Of all the people in the empire, Mordecai? Now, is not, that was probably not a good time to bring up the execution. Let's step back and look at this from a greater height. Where is the king who is mightier than Ahasuerus that never sleeps? He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, as the, as the psalmist writes. His providence flows like lava down the mountainside, red hot and unstoppable. If Mordecai had received thanks for saving Ahasuerus some years earlier, would the king have felt indebted to him now? If the king had not been sleepless that night, might Mordecai have died on the gallows before Esther could save her people? What would the end of the story be if the king had wanted to listen to music instead of having someone read to cure his insomnia that night? What if, what if, what if? The possibilities are endless. But the aggregate of them is not greater than the decrees and divine purposes of God. Paul writes in Ephesians 1 about the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. This is not passive observation, but active involvement. It's demonstrated again and again in this small Old Testament book, and it's demonstrated again and again in our lives today. Haman departed the king's presence and went to the king's gate where he found Mordecai still attired in sackcloth and ashes and probably surprised him beyond imagination. Instead of berating him for his insolence, he dressed him in the royal robes and placed him on the royal horse and led him through the streets of Susa, all the while proclaiming, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Nearly everywhere they went, they would have been able to see the top of that beam that Haman had erected to exhibit Mordecai in a different way. The text is silent as to any conversations the two might have had with each other during this time, but it doesn't take much imagination to surmise that they probably didn't speak at all. Haman, apoplectic and speechless at his humiliation and at Mordecai's exultation, and Mordecai, more stunned at the turn of events than anything else. But the real indication of the difference between them comes at the end of their tour through the capital. Mordecai returned to his job at the king's gate as humble as he ever was, while Haman went home in mourning, as the text says. It was as if he'd experienced the death of a close friend, and so he had his ego. His world had begun to collapse around him. And to add insult to injury, his wife and his wise friends now said that if Mordecai is of God's people, Haman would not overcome him, but would surely fall before him. Gee, thanks. And here we'll leave the story for this morning. We see yet again the hand of God protecting his people, instilling courage where there had been none ensuring triumph over evil as a foreshadowing of what will be done at the last day. Do we see ourselves in the story of Mordecai and Esther? Perhaps not in the station of life they enjoyed, for none of us are royalty or cousins to royalty, but we do enjoy the protection of the Lord God, as did they. We are covered by his hand and look forward to the day when evil is defeated forever. When God's people will, as one, proclaim holy, holy, 
Holy is the Lord God of hosts who was and is and is to come. Until then, we cling to his promises just as Mordecai did. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We thank and praise you this morning for your providence at work in the world. For the protection of your people and for your using the the everyday activities of life to bring about your purposes. Give us the faith to trust you. To take you at your word. We look forward to the day when evil will be abolished forever. When we can join in that heavenly course, praising your name. But in the meantime, we, we ask that you continue to we ask that you continue to preserve us just as you did in Esther's day. Come what will, we'll give you all the glory. Our hope, our expectation is that you'll cover us with your hand. And we thank you for that. But most of all, we thank you for our Savior Jesus and, and the salvation he bought for us with his blood. And now as we leave this place this morning, give us safe travel to our destinations and grant us, the, grant us the privilege of being your witnesses to the uttermost ends of the earth. For we ask all this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, before we dismiss, uh, I'm asked to remind everyone that um, socializing should happen out in the, out in the parking lot or in the in the areas outside the church, take your masks off or whatever, but let's, um, let's close with uh, what the writer to the Hebrews exhorted us. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Christ Jesus to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.